you. What an amazing day. I'm going to talk about Uri Alon. Uri's a scientist. And I spend quite a lot of time with scientists, uh, not just because I'm married with one, married to one, um, but because I'm really interested in how scientists do what they do. Because what they do is they find really hard problems and they try to solve them, generally in a very competitive environment, with generally not enough time and very, very little glory. And I have this kind of hypothesis that if I can figure out how they do that, then we can all figure out how we do that. Because if you're coming into areas like innovation, what do innovators do? They find really hard problems and solve them in a competitive environment with very little time. But sometimes lots of glory, right? So Uri's a really interesting guy. He's made uh, enormous breakthroughs in the area between biology and physics. He works at the Weizmann Lab in Israel. And he's famous for many of his scientific discoveries, but he's most famous of all for a scientific paper that he wrote called How to Run a Motivated Research Team. And you might expect that, like other scientific journals, this article would be full of diagrams and equations that you can't really understand. But actually, it's full of all sorts of things that are just kind of blindingly obvious, except that we mostly go through life not seeing them. And when I asked Dory, why was it his lab was so incredibly productive, he told me a really interesting story. And it segues very beautifully with what Alistair and Jeff were talking about. He said that when he was a postdoc and he was starting really the beginning of his hard work as a scientist, there were times that he couldn't get out of bed in the morning because he felt so tired and so confused and so anxious. He felt he was really hitting the buffers of his own capability. And he thought, maybe I'm not made to be a scientist after all. Maybe I don't know what I'm doing. Maybe the project is wrong. Now, he was just completely lost and confused. And he described it as being in a cloud because he couldn't tell which way to go. And I said to him, so what got you through that, Ori? And he said, I had some really great friends. I had just a few really great friends. And they came up and they'd support me or they'd take me out for a drink or they'd give me an idea. Or they'd scream at me or they'd laugh with me. They somehow seemed to know what I needed. And then when I got through and I looked back and I thought, how did I do that? They were just kind of there waving at me and saying, we always knew you'd get through it. But you need friends. You need friends. Now, it's hard having friends at work, and it's partly hard having friends at work because we're not really brought up to think that work is a place where we're going to find or make friends. Work is the place where we're going to compete, where we have to outcompete, outwork, outprove ourselves to those around us. And of course, if we maintain that attitude, highly inculcated at school, it makes work particularly difficult. Because really at work, being excellent isn't really enough. What you need to do is to be trusted. It's to be trustworthy. And if you're going to be trusted and trustworthy, it's going to be because you trust other people and you're generous and you help them. And instead of competing with them, you support and encourage them. The secret of Uri Alon's lab, as it turns out, is that he insists that every, in every week's lab meeting, and scientists mostly have lab meetings on Tuesdays, two hours, first thing in the morning, worldwide. I don't know why. But the first half hour of Uri's lab meeting is unusual because he won't let any of his scientists talk about science. Now, scientists don't want to talk about anything else, right? <laughs> but he insists you can talk about politics or theater or sport or your kids or the weather or whatever you want to do, but you may not talk about science. And the reason that Uri did this, he told me, 
was that he realized that mostly what his scientists in his lab would come in and do is they'd come in and they'd start working really hard and they'd compete with each other wildly and then they'd go home at the end of the day. And he said, as long as that's what they did, nothing got done. And so he introduced this half hour just as an experiment. Scientists always think experimentally. Because he said, I want people in my lab to see each other, not just as scientists, but as human beings. And I want them to see that they have a lot in common with people who don't look like them or sound like them or come from Israel, people who aren't Jewish or people who aren't male or people who aren't female. People wildly different from them can still care about them. And what it means is that when they hit that cloud, and they will hit it if they're doing anything worthwhile, they know they are surrounded by people who will get them through it. And this is meaningful to me not just because I care hugely about the kind of moral, spiritual, emotional atmosphere that happens at work, but because in any kind of company, if you're going to do breakthrough, creative, interesting work, you too are going to hit that cloud. And you can either back out and never do anything interesting, or keep going because other people help you. And this is never more the case than when you encounter something at work that makes you uncomfortable, unnerves you, makes you wonder, is that right? Did I hear that right? Can that be true? Did he really say that to her? Did she really not get heard at that meeting? Is it really the case that nobody's ever mentioned such and such? I talked to an executive the other day. He said, you know, it's incredible. I work in the hotel industry, and for five years, we managed never, ever, at any board meeting, to talk about Airbnb. <laughs> how did that happen? I'd like to know how many conversations weren't had at Facebook. I know that when Facebook came out, there were conversations that didn't happen at Google. And what gives people the courage to say, hey, this is kind of interesting, we should think about this. Or, you know, I really don't think that behavior is quite what we aspire to here. Or, are we really sure we want to cut those jobs? Because don't you think it could leave our customers or our patients exposed? To have those conversations, the breakthrough conversations, Alistair Campbell's quite right. It's not about courage. It's about support. It's about sounding boards. It's about having people you can try these conversations out with and who will tell you the truth. They'll tell you, actually, Margaret, your idea's nuts. Nobody's going to listen because we tried it five years ago and it didn't work. Or they'll tell you, I think that's a good idea, but you should go to the meeting with some more people. Or probably don't use the rude words. You know, they're probably not going to advance your case very much. We need people around us who aren't sucking up to us, who aren't afraid of us, who aren't competing with us, but who want the best for us, who can put their agenda aside every now and then when we need it to help us understand what ours is and how we can advance it. Now, I organized a session about a year ago for about 70 executives specifically to talk about this subject of friendship. And I brought in two very eminent chief executives who talked very candidly about the professional and personal crises in their lives and how they could not have got through those crises without each other. These are big, serious, important men at the top of the British establishment saying, actually, I couldn't have done this without a friend who had my best interests at heart. And afterwards, I went on a walk with a number of people who'd been in the audience. And they all were quite moved by what they'd heard. But they said, you know, 
We don't have any time to, for friends. I mean, I remember I used to have friends, but now I have, you know, kids and husband and family and, and just work. And there's just nothing left. There's just nothing left. And as we walked, this great cloud of loneliness descended on them. And I thought, this is the moment. In this cloud, just as Uriolon said, when you don't know which way it is up, this is the moment at which the risk of making the wrong turn is the most acute. When you might back down, or you might fly off the handle, or you might give up. And that's the moment if you're going to do anything interesting, if you're going to do anything meaningful and valuable in the world, that's the moment that you're going to need friends. Now, this is personal for me. It's not just theoretical. It's not just because every chief executive I have ever known sooner or later has talked to me about the friends that got them to where they are. And it's not just about having friends so you can climb up the ladder. I am not talking about networking. I am talking about soulmates, people different from you who can see your qualities. I'm talking about people who care and don't think that's a sign of weakness. I'm th talking about people who may be competitive, but not with you, only for excellence. And of course, I'm talking about myself. One of the things I'm most proud of is how many of my former employees I'm still friends with. And I'm probably even prouder of how many of them are still friends with each other, to the point that they now all recruit each other because they want to keep working together. Because yes, they're colleagues, and yes, they're co-workers, but they're friends, and it's why they can do such tremendous work together, because they have all of that generosity and trust that when you roll it all up, we call social capital. The social capital that makes them and the organizations they work with truly resilient, strong enough, confident enough, eager enough, ambitious enough, creative enough, to get through the cloud to create something the world has never seen before. And it's personal too because when I was 30 years old and just two years married, my husband was killed in front of me. And I was in a big powerful job and what got me through that and through the court case and through years of misery and loneliness, what got me through that were my friends. Yeah, my family is helpful too, of course they were, you kind of expect that. But the friends were the people I saw at work every day. The friends were the people at work who realized if I was having an off day that they'd cut me a little bit of slack. The friends were the people who realized that I didn't have anyone to go home to anymore. And yeah, it would be nice to go out for a drink or to the movies or something to pretend I was still human until maybe one day I would be again. And it's personal too because one of my best friends died two years ago. I'd met him through work too. He was a brilliant, inspiring, funny, wry, intelligent, wicked, harsh critic. And I feel he's still with me because every time I try to do something difficult and stumble, I see him standing there thinking, well, go on, pick yourself up, keep going, don't quit. Why would you? That's not what we do, Margaret. And every time I do something that I think, oh, was that okay? I sort of see him on the sidelines saying, yeah, it was okay, you could probably do better. And every now and then, I just see him smile, and I think, wow, that must have been really good, <laughs> right? 
But I couldn't do any of the things that I've done if I didn't have those people inside me and outside me. Not because of their contacts, not because of their know-how, not because of their power networks, but because they feed my sense of myself and they hold me to an incredibly high standard. And they remind me that any time you're going to do something really outstanding, meaningful, valuable, something in the world that matters, you cannot do it alone. You look at any breakthrough of any kind, any real achievement, and you can trace a family tree of friendship. Now, we've talked a lot about resilience today. We've talked a lot about the kind of networks you need for political resilience. We've talked a lot about the kind of attitudes to physical health and mental health that requires resilience. And we've talked a lot about resili where resilience comes from. And let's not forget that resilience is about the power to keep going when things get really difficult. The ability to absorb pain and doubt and confusion and anxiety. The ability to see that there are reasons to keep going. And for my money, what gives us those reasons is each other. For all the creative people I've worked with, in all the creative organizations that I've worked with, it's been the same story as in Uri Alon's lab. That what keeps people motivated and ambitious for the best in themselves and the best in each other is just each other. Thank you very much.